Our speaker today is Michael Kagan. Michael received his PhD in experimental particle physics from Harvard in 2012. Ever since, he has been affiliated with the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory at Stanford. He is also a member of the ATLAS collaboration, which operates the experiment of the same name at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. With his work, Michael harnesses the power of neural networks to extend the physics capabilities of ATLAS, but also teaches the wider particle physics community how to use these techniques well. Many of these applications have more general cousins that lie beyond the boundaries of high energy physics. In today's seminar, he will cover two such examples, namely optimal experiment design and unfolding. And with that, Michael, over to you. Uh, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction and for inviting me here today and everybody for coming. Uh, let me share my screen. It's, um, okay, I think, can you see that okay? Yep, that comes up nicely. Okay, great. So yeah, so yeah, thanks. Um, thanks very much for the intro. Um, so today yeah, I'll be talking about how we're um, some of the work we've recently been doing recently been doing on um, using these very powerful tools that have come about in the last few years, uh, generative models um, for helping in some of our inference tasks. So mainly optimization uh, and unfolding in in high energy physics, but. Um, as was mentioned, these are methods that can be used elsewhere. And one of the places where this, that we're really gonna be focusing is on the kind of boundary between machine learning and the simulators that we use in, 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 in high energy physics and, and other sciences. Um, so I should mention um, that many collaborators worked on this, so great work, um, even some of them from here at Oxford, Gunesh. Um, so I wanna mention them up front and their, their nice work here. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about using generative models in different kind of inference pipelines, different um, analysis settings. And um, in many sense, uh, the, when we think about generative models, they're approximators. They're basically approximating and simulating a data generation process, whether that's you know, in high energy physics, in cosmology, in, in, um, in climate, uh, climate modeling. And effectively, generative models cover a very wide array of, of these processes, scientific simulators, differential equations, modeling physical processes, um, and even more recently, things like deep generative models. Now, deep generative models and scientific simulators have um, certainly different properties, um, but in some sense, they're both trying to model this data generation process. And when we look um, at the kind of differences or we kind of compare and contrast the two, when we think about scientific simulators, we're, we're thinking about these, these computer codes often um, that are built from our scientific knowledge, kind of built from the foundational principles um, by reducing a complex physical phenomenon, a complex observation and detector like at ATLAS at the LHC and breaking it down into its components so we can simulate it from the ground up. It tends to have relatively few parameters. The parameters, for instance, of the model, the standard model in, in high energy physics, maybe the, the, the parameters of the geometry of your experiment, but these are often very interpretable. And because of the kind of physics ground up um, approach to scientific simulators, they can be very high fidelity, but often computationally costly. On the other hand, when we think about machine learning for generating data, we're thinking about models that can have millions, billions, and even these days, um, there's a pushing towards trillions of parameters. Um, they're not necessarily interpretable. Um, but, the, but instead of using physics knowledge to build up the simulator, we're using data to fit all these parameters. And we use some of our knowledge potentially about the physical processes to design the model, design an optimization process. But in general, it's kind of a large uh, function fit with some structure added in. So this can be slow to train when you're training millions or billions of parameters, but afterwards it's an evaluation of a neural network, an evaluation of a function which can be relatively fast. Um, and so there's really this kind of learning from data process and building up foundational knowledge. Um, and today we're gonna to be talking about trying to put these two together. So one of the reasons we might wanna put these two together is when you look at simulators in something like high energy physics um, or in, in many domains, um, we, we have this reductionist approach to understanding how data is generated. We have uh, a theory like the standard model. We can generate, um, we can generate interactions from, from, this, uh, from this model, plausible interactions, in this case, producing top quarks. There's a, for instance, a radiative process that's roughly independent of the previous process. It's at a different energy scale. We can produce particles that we might see in a detector, and then we can simulate their interaction in the detector. And this kind of goes from a model that has something like 19 parameters into uh, 
observations in a detector that have 100 million um, um, sensor readouts, 100 million points or parts of that, uh, that observation. So while we know all the how to simulate and build up these 100 million detector element observations, um, we can't compute the probability of seeing any given observation. We don't know what the probability of this configuration is. So this is kind of an observation of the detector. We don't know its probability. Um, so we can simulate it. We have a mechanistic understanding of interactions. We can generate plausible samples. We can say, what, what do samples look like given, given these parameters? But we cannot say how likely anything is. And that turns out to put constraints on our analyses when we want to do uh, inference. So while it's straightforward to run the simulator in the forward direction, kind of this black box simulator here on the bottom, we can run it forward given a set of parameters to produce observations. It's very hard to take a set of observations and invert this process. Um, the reason why we don't have likelihoods in some sense is because in the middle of this simulation process, going from parameters to these intermediate um, steps of our physical simulation to our eventual observations, there's many random processes going on. And in order to kind of compute the likelihood of any observation, we'd have to integrate over all these millions and millions of uh, random variables or latent information that may be occurring in the process of this simulation. In, in, this, in the collider setting, this may be radiating particles, radiating energy, and particles interacting with detector elements. So we want to be thinking about how we can take these simulations and, and use machine learning, essentially, to help do inference, learning about parameters, or learning, learning about this latent information in, in, in the simulation chain. So the kinds of common questions that come up um, are things that, you know, they have terms in, 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 in particle physics like reconstruction, given an observation, what was, what was the, the properties of the particle that produced that? So given an electron's energy that we observe in a detector, what was its true energy that entered the detector? Or if we have a distribution of electrons and we want to know uh, distribution of electron energy, we want to know the distribution that was input to the detector that might be unfolding that we'll talk about a little bit later. We may want to infer the parameters of the standard model. What's the Z mass given a bunch of dielectron events? Um, and even, uh, even further, supposing we wanted to build a detector that was even better at measuring the Z mass, we may want to try to optimally design that experiment to tune the parameters of the experiment structure of the, the detector geometry. So these are the kinds of questions we may want to ask, which are challenging due to the, the nature of the simulator, the fact that we can't evaluate the likelihood of any simulation that we produce. Um, so when we kind of write this down in terms of um, you know, common inference questions, we might want to do maximum likelihood. So finding the parameters, you know, given some, with some observations, what are the parameters that would make that, those observations most likely? We may want to compute posteriors. If we want to use Bayes' rule and, uh, and to compute a posterior given observations, what are the, the distribution of parameters that, that, that could plausibly give those observations? Or when we think about optimization or simulator tuning, we kind of pose it as not just, uh, uh, not, maximum likelihood in the same way, but we want to maximize or minimize some cost function, some objective. Um, for instance, if we want particles to be swept away from a detector, we want to um, minimize the cost of, of particles hitting a detector, as we'll see in an example later. So today we're, we're going to be doing, we're talking about uh, some techniques in simulation-based inference, which is this combination of machine learning and simulators, where we're going to be combining the benefits of simulators to produce um, high fidelity data with generative models. And effectively, one of the tricks that comes in along the way is we're going to be using this, the simulator to produce observations and generative models for sampling, for density estimation. And very importantly, when we want to do optimization, we're going to be using them to approximate gradients. So this is, um, this is the, the, the kind of thing I mean when we're talking about deep generative models. You um, likely have seen these in other seminars, so I'm not going to go through them in too much detail. I'll talk about them a little bit later in different sections of the talk. But we're, what we're talking about here is things like generative adversarial networks, variational autoencoders, um, or normalizing flows. And these are different kinds of generative models. And the thing that I want to emphasize here is in each of these models, we have something like a generator or a decoder or uh, kind of a neural network that can, in, in the, the bijective that can go backwards and forwards. Um, but the point that I want to focus on here is that basically these models are built around what's, a, what's called a latent variable model. We have some latent random variable, which is a distribution that we know and we can easily sample from. Most often this is something like a Gaussian, a multidimensional Gaussian. And we apply some function to that, some deterministic function that whose output is um, 
for instance, a sample of a plausible sample of, of the data set. And so these deep generative models are basically parameterizing the transformation from a latent noise variable, Z, into something that looks like real data. And this transformation is typically a neural network in this case um, that depends on some parameters. And most importantly, it's continuous. We can take the, the derivative of this neural network, which means for any sample that we produce from this generative model, we know how that sample's output, we know the, how the features of that you know, generated data point depends on either this latent random variable or any parameters of the model. So we basically can sample data points and take their gradients and use that for optimization. And that's, we're gonna be talking about that in two forms uh, throughout the rest of the talk. So we can dive right in into the first uh, aspect, um, which is black box optimization or design optimization with what we call local generative models. So um, to kind of give you the problem set up, we can think about this in a physics setting. So in this, in this case, we have a magnet here in green that has some parameters. These parameters define the geometry of the magnet. Um, what's going to be happening is we're gonna be, some muons are gonna be sent into this magnet and they're gonna be swept to the left and right by the magnet itself. And our goal is to optimize the magnet design so that the muons are swept in, swept away from the detector. So we can see detector observations here on the bottom. And we wanna, for instance, sweep the magnets outside of this purple box where the, where the, the sensitive detector elements are. So in order to do that, one of the things we can do is we can simulate this whole process. So we have some simulator, something like Giant, where we can simulate the impact of a magnet on um, an incoming muon. And with that simulator, we can generate lots of data and we can define an objective function. For instance, a, a very simple one would be um, we, uh, we lose or the, the loss increases if muons are inside of this detector region and then the loss decreases if they are outside of the detector region. Um, that, that's not particularly differentiable, but, that, but some smooth version of a loss like that may be something we as users would define in order to say this is better or worse. So because this is a stochastic process, we'll, our objective is gonna be the expected value of this, this, this loss or this objective um, over a bunch of nuons. So our goal then is to optimize or minimize this objective function R given uh, over the set of magnet geometry parameters. Now, this is a bit challenging. Often when we think about optimization, one of the first things that come to mind is gradient-based optimization, but our simulator here is you know, a computer code that's been developed for many years. We can't necessarily compute gradients. So how do we do this? Um, ah, sorry, but maybe to set up a flow chart of this process, um, we can, here we've formalized, we've written down the, the kind of minimization problem here for design optimization. Um, we're sampling data points uh, and computing their loss. And basically given some inputs and parameters, we can run the simulator to produce outputs and evaluate the objective. But we don't know how to compute the gradient of the simulator with respect to the parameters. So that's why I say this is a black box optimization. We don't have access to the internal gradients of this simulation code. Um, so how would we normally do this? Well, I mean, in a physics setting, when there's been decades of research on detectors, one, one approach is expert intuition. Um, certainly people with many years of experience can have a very good idea of, of how to start optimizing these um, new, new devices. But in a more general sense, um, if we want to optimize some generic cost function, we might rely on something like numerical derivatives, finite differences. Now these can have numerical instabilities when the step sizes are very small or with stochastic functions. Um, we can think about other methods such as it's called a score function estimator. This is basically the reinforced algorithm or the reinforced gradient that's used in reinforcement learning. Now this can be applied here, but tends to have high variance. And there's other techniques like Bayesian optimization, but these can be costly because they involve large, they can potentially involve large matrix inversions. Um, so we've been, we were in, in approaching this problem where we have a very costly simulator, in this case, to optimize a magnet design. We need to be able to run a very costly simulator, which is Geon. We wanted to think about ways in which we could reliably compute gradients and perform gradient descent. So if we look back at our optimization problem, um, although we can't take gradients of the simulator, one of the things we can do, as we were discussing a bit earlier, is we can approximate this simulator. So this black dotted box, we're going to basically approximate this process with a generative model, and we call that a surrogate. So now in um, this surrogate will basically be a generative model that's trained by taking our simulator, 
generating a bunch of data points and learning to produce, you know, given our data points and some random vector, a, a latent random variable Z, whose distribution we know, we can output a plausible sample from, from the true simulator. So we're basically building a generative model to mimic this, this dotted box here. So what we typically rely on in, 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 uh, in this work, we've been using GANs. GANs tend to be very good at generating plausible, uh, reasonable looking data. And um, we'll talk about them only very briefly. Um, and again, we start with um, a generative adversarial network. We start with some random noise Z. We're gonna apply some function that outputs uh, a sample of the right uh, dimensionality of the data, in this case, an image, in this N by N image. Um, and the output of this generative model, this generator, is fed into a discriminator D, whose job is to tell the difference between real and fake images. Now, in this example, it's not hard to tell the difference, but as they're trained, this becomes harder and harder. And so it becomes an adversarial game, a competition between the generator trying to produce more plausible, plausible images and the discriminator trying to, to tell the difference between, um, between real and fake images. So this is set up then as a minimax, object, uh, minimax uh, optimization problem where the, the classification loss of the discriminator is basically the objective and we're maximizing the discrimination power whilst trying to minimize the discrimination power with the generator. Now, we're not gonna talk much about the training dynamics. These are a little bit tricky to deal with, but nonetheless, we can go ahead and train them on our data set with, with, um, with some tricks of the trade. Um, and in the result, for instance, in a very simple example here, um, is we might start out with a magnet. We're trying to um, simulate plausible muon hits on a detector when we send muons through a magnet. And we're basically given, we give a, a, this GAN, the input vec four vector of a, of a muon, the input direction of a muon, and it outputs um, a hit on a detector. So as we can adjust the length of this magnet, magnet and have this generative model learn how to generate plausible images as a function of length. So here, as the length of the magnet increases, the, the muons hitting the detector are separated. And if you look on the left and right, this is a comparison between this, this generative model and the, the true simulator, and it's a relatively good match. So we can, we can generate reasonably plausible looking data. So that's very good. At least the step of trying to emulate our simulator is something we think we can do. And uh, it's not too surprising. These models are very powerful. Um, but we need to go one step further. We don't just want to generate data, we also want to be able to optimize what the parameters we're going to be using are. What are the best parameters of this magnet? So when we look at this uh, loss function, we're basically looking at the expected value of this objective. Where we're, we're basically adding up the loss or the, the, the objective function um, for every simulator call, every simulator simulated data point. Um, instead of evaluating this loss on Using the simulated outputs, we can evaluate it using this, this generative model, which we call the surrogate here, S. It takes as input the parameters of the, of the model or the parameters of the geometry in this case. Um, it takes as input, for instance, some random variable, the muons, and it takes a random variable so we can generate stochastically uh, potential observations. And nicely, if we compute the gradient of this, uh, this approximate objective here on the bottom, we can use the chain rule and pass the gradient right through. This requires the objective to be um, differentiable, but that's typically not the challenge. It's usually the simulator that's the, the differentiable problem. So in this case, we can pass the gradients directly through this objective function to compute gradients of the generative model with respect to the parameters we want to optimize. So because we can compute those gradients with respect to the parameters, we can now do gradient descent here. So we basically can iteratively compute the gradients of this objective, update the, the set of parameters, and repeat until, until convergence, gradient, basic gradient descent algorithms. And so we can go ahead and do this on that um, uh, on various different kinds of toy examples. In this case, we can look at the expected loss. The loss is a function of different parameter values on a toy problem. This is a two-dimensional toy problem with the loss function shown here by different colors. And blue is the kind of the minimum. Uh, and it's basically a ring it's, it's, um, that's, a, that's, that's sloping upward away from the center. It's kind of down and up. Now, when we look at this true loss function, we could start um, at any point in this parameter space, psi one and psi two, and run gradient descent, and it would basically take us directly down to somewhere on this blue minimum ring. Um, when we're trying to approximate this with a generative model, it's, it's a fair bit noisier. You can see this approximate, we've evaluated um, 
the generative model at various points uh, in psi one and in parameter space. And you can see it's not perfect, but it's quite reasonable. And at different points where these represented by these triangles, we can run gradient descent using these, this approximate simulator and the gradient descent works reasonably well. We can find our way to this ring. Um, okay, so this, this works, this is a nice example that shows that we can kind of do gradient descent with generative model based gradients in two dimensions. But it turns out scaling this to high dimensions is quite challenging. Um, the reason, the way you can think about that, or the reason for this is when you have many, many parameters, it's very hard to learn simultaneously over all parameters, uh, not only a very good generative model, but also very good gradients. If we didn't sample enough points in important regions of the parameter space, we may be completely interpolating with the generative model. That's, that's not gonna be great. Um, so learning in high dimensions all at once didn't really work so well for us. So we started to think more and more um, about gradient descent as an algorithm. You know, at each point in gradient descent, you're computing the gradient at the current parameter point. You don't need to know what's happening in some far off point in the, the loss function space in this objective. Um, so with that in mind, we looked at this optimization algorithm and instead of trying to learn over all parameters at once, um, what we ended up realizing is we can just learn a generative model around the current parameter space. So if we're running gradient descent, we have some value of the parameter psi. We can learn a generative model just in some, for instance, box or some region right around where we are in parameter space, approximate the loss function locally. And that's enough for us to learn a gradient over the loss surface and take a gradient step. So the algorithm kind of gets extended in this sense where Given some set of parameters, we sample different values of the parameters in some local region. We use that to run our simulator and generate training data. We train a generative model. That generative model can then be used to take a gradient step to update the parameters and then start over again with finding a local region and making a local approximation of the loss function. So we're training a generative model at every step of gradient descent, but we can do that because um, we can we can do that because we can always locally we can always sample these parameters locally. Of course, if the simulator is very fast, training a generative model may end up being very costly in time. But in many cases, the simulator can be very very slow, and the additional time spent training a generative model may not be um, the highest cost in the process. So, if we kind of look at a cartoon of this happening um, on the right, on the top, you can see we this is a kind of um, complex loss function as a function of the two parameters with two minimum on the top and bottom here in blue. We're trying to make our way to the red star. And at each step of gradient descent, we're retraining a generative model and approximating its gradients. And you can see here on the bottom, the comparison between the true gradients in this toy problem where we know what the gradients are and those estimated by this, by the GAN, by the generative model. And they match reasonably well. They're certainly correlated and they allow us to take good gradient steps uh, down this, this, this loss function. So you can see in black is the region where we're actually sampling data points and approximating the, uh, the loss function and outside is, is um, an extrapolation where the gradients tend to not be as, uh, as informative. Okay, so with this local model in hand, we can test this on a variety of toy problems. There's, there's various toy problems in the optimization literature that people often uh, try to approach. So one of them is, for instance, a 10 dimensional Rosenbrock problem that has multiple minimum um, we also tested this um, on trying to optimize the weights of a neural network. Given a neural network uh, output um, and some loss function, we can try to directly run gradient descent by um, approximating uh, the neural network itself and trying to output updates of its weights. So that was kind of a fun example. Um, so what we do is we compare this optimization example, uh, this optimization approach with things like numerical optimizations, finite differences, Bayesian optimization, or these reinforcement learning type approaches. And that's in blue, for instance. Um, and what we see in, in red and green are the generative model-based approaches, these local generative model approaches. Um, and in terms of the number of function calls to reach a minimum, they tend to be very competitive um, with many of the other algorithms, some of them um, even faster than, than many. Now, this depends on the complexity of the problem. But we can see that in terms of the number of simulator calls, this can actually op this method can actually optimize reasonably quickly, which is good. Um, we can try to minimize how many times we actually have to generate data from a slow simulator. On the right, when trying to do this with a neural network optimization, we can optimize it relatively quickly and relatively uh, even better 
than some of the recent kind of reinforcement learning based approaches. Although at very, very large number of function calls, they tend to, to, to reach very similar minimum. So we can nicely see that we can, we can optimize these spaces, these, these, these objective functions quite well. Um, and one of the things we also noticed is when there's some degeneracy in the parameters, when two parameters are kind of controlling the same part of the simulator, we can still optimize. Um, and that, that tends to be a setting that's very difficult in, in a lot of other cases, especially numerical optimization. Um, so we can move on from toy problems and have a look more closely, oh, sorry, have a look more closely at a physics problem. So in this case, we can go back to this magnet problem, but instead of just optimizing the one dimensional length of a magnet, we can have a multi-stage magnet. In this case, it's a, it's, this is a simplified version of the ship experiment, which is basically a magnet with 42 degrees of freedom that control the length, the height of the beginning and the end of the magnet, um, the gaps between the magnets. Um, so as I mentioned, this is simplified, but certainly much more realistic than our one-dimensional magnet system. Um, and in this case, uh, this experiment is looking for um, dark sector mediators, and one of the goals is to sweep away muons uh, from the detector apparatus, from the detection uh, surface area with such a magnet. So we can, we can run this approach, basically iteratively running Giant, generating simulation, simulations and approximating the generative model for gradient descent. And we can see the, nice, the, the loss nicely kind of drops over, over time. And in fact, you can kind of look at how the magnet shapes. This is the end, uh, this is basically the gap at the end of the magnets for each of five magnet stages. And you can see how these gaps are shrinking and expanding as we perform gradient descent. So this is very nice to be able to look back and see um, uh, interpretably, because we're taking gradients with respect to interpretable parameters, how the why the loss is changing with respect to different changes in, in the uh, parameter structure, input parameter structure. So you can see a cartoon of that uh, optimization taking place. This is the kind of one of uh, 2D projections of that uh, 3D picture I showed on the last slide. Z is the kind of length of the magnet, and this is the X and Y cross section on top and bottom. And you can see um, basically across the entire optimization, it was pushing the magnet to be longer and, and shaping various gaps in between the magnets. Um, when compared to a recent um, uh, approach to do this with Bayesian optimization, we were able to um, not only get a, a better loss, basically sweep more muons away, but um, have a shorter and lighter magnet. Now, this is still a simplified simulation, but I think it's exciting for application in, in, uh, in more realistic settings. Um, so just a few technical details, pros and cons. When we, when we dig into the details of these generative models, when we look at these gradients, um, nicely we see that, that they don't tend to be biased. They tend to be pointing approximately along the, the direction of the true gradient. So this is the average difference between a true gradient and the approximated gradient in toy problems where we, um, where we know what the, the true gradients are. So they're basically consistent with having zero bias. So that's very good that we're, we're consistently taking gradient steps in the right direction. But unfortunately, one of the cons here is we have to basically train a generative model at each gradient update step. And we can kind of use simulations from previous steps, but, but it still tends to be relatively costly in terms of generation time or training time for generators. Um, the other challenge here is that gradient descent tends to find the closest minimum so if it's a very complex loss surface, sometimes making your way to the closest minimum may not be ideal. And so thinking about exploration versus exploitation trade-offs and combining these methods with, with some of the exploration capabilities of Bayesian optimization, I think is a, is a fun direction to go in the future. But nonetheless, um, that's kind of where we, um, that's where we were able to, um, to do optimization so far. And we um, and in the next part of this talk, I'll be talking not just about finding some single point uh, in some optimization problem, but trying to find a distribution of parameters or distribution of latent variables that could have generated a set of observations. Um, so I don't know if it makes sense to, to, to pause for questions now or maybe finish up and then wait for questions at the end. Philip, I don't know if you have a preference. I don't have a preference, but let's just take a roll call. Does anybody have any urgent questions now? Uh, can I just ask a, a sort of basic question? Um, you're getting the gradients from uh, to do gradient descent from the generative models, uh, and they appear to be much better than trying to get them just from uh, simulation. Uh, now, is it just because with the generative model, with the GAN, you get many more samples? So in uh, when we're in, in terms of 
just doing it with the simulator or something like finite difference methods. You know, one of the problems, especially if you need to make small steps is that can be quite noisy and you can be sensitive to even um, uh, numerical approximation errors. Um, so what we're basically doing with the generative model is fitting a local model to the structure of the, of the loss function. So we're, we're kind of able to interpolate even in relatively complicated loss function spaces. And then the gradients are more well-defined. With finite differences, it can be quite noisy and they don't tend to work so, so well in, in stochastic optimization problems. When there's a lot of random noise coming from, um, from the stochastic um, nature of the simulator, they can be even noisier. So we find that we're able to kind of interpolate very well and approximate the loss surface. And so that's where the benefit's coming, the kind of approximation capabilities of the generative model. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Duncan, you also have a question, please go ahead. Hi, thanks, Michael. Um, I just had a query about training of the GANs. So yeah. um, if I understood this right, you're, you're able to train these GANs on only tens of simulations, is that is that right? I mean, my my feeling from, from this would be that you'd need many, many thousands of, of um, training data, data samples to, to train again. I guess it depends how big your GAN is, but I'd be interested to hear about those kind of um, trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, right. So there's there's various numbers here that are important, um, which I didn't go through in detail to, to not get too, not to obscure the, sure. the, the too much the details or to obscure the, the goal. Um, right. So in this process, we have both the parameters and, well, I can see, you can see, we have both the parameters and the observations we're trying to generate. So at any given value of the parameter, we may simulate a large number of potential observations. So we're getting a good um, uh, set of training data to, for, the, for the generative model for the GAN to understand how to, to plausibly generate stochastically observations for a fixed parameter set. Oh, yeah. What we then do is we simulate lots of data with lots of parameters and train it all at the same time. Um, so although we may only, you know, in a two dimensional parameter space, we may only sample three, four, five different values of the parameters. Yeah. For each value, we may simulate five, 10,000 points. Is that just because that's cheap for your simulator? So, so sampling that latent space is cheap in your simulator, in your forward model, is it? Which one, you mean in the actual simulator? Yeah. Yeah. No, that can be very costly. And that's why if you look, we don't talk much about wall clock time in terms of training. We're talking almost yeah. exclusively about the number of function calls. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, these toy examples, the, the simulation time is trivial. Um, uh, the, the, but the, the GAN training time can be quite, well, these aren't very big problems, so it's not very long. Um, but in something when you're like running Geont where, you know, simulating a thousand events can take an hour, yeah. um, that the trade-off there really changes quite a bit. So we're not so worried about wall clock time. So we, we're basically assuming that in the kind of examples where you'd want to use this, the simulator is going to be quite, quite slow. And your main goal is basically you're willing to spend a little time getting a better gradient estimate um, because sampling more simulator calls is gonna be much more costly. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, not sam just running more simulator calls is gonna be more costly. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So it's not necessarily cheap to generate the data, but you have to do that no matter what. Yeah. Do you, just as a matter of curiosity, do you, do you have some nice interface for automatically setting up these runs? I guess you, you spend a bit of time kind of creating a, a an automated way of spinning off these geon runs because otherwise it's it's pretty tedious. For the uh, for the for the for the full example, yeah, this was all containerized and set up to run on a. I'm not sure if it was a Kubernetes cluster, but it, at the very least, it was a it was a cluster that can handle uh, dealing with. Yeah. Um, um, Docker and Singularity containers where you can run internally the, the simulator, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. I should note that that was really the students who put that together. That was not, not me who wrote the, the, uh, the, camp, the containerized uh, ship simulation. No worries. Um, okay, so why don't we uh, move on to the next section? Uh, thanks for the questions. Um, so in the next section, uh, so in the last section, we were kind of setting up these objectives and trying to find one value of these parameters that optimize this objective. Um, now, when we think about unfolding, we're thinking more about finding distributions. Given some set of observations, 
given some set of observations, what is the source distribution? What's the distribution of inputs that went through some smearing process that generated those observations? So it might be, you know, we have some distribution of electrons produced from the decay of Z bosons. Um, they run through a detector. We observe the, the, their energy in the detector. That's some smeared out version of the distribution of the, the source distribution. Um, and our goal is, you know, from the output distribution, what's the input distribution? So you can write that down kind of probabilistically, you know, that the probability of some observation, the probability distribution of the observations um, is an integral over these unobserved variables, these true values as we'll call them, um, basically a true distribution that's integrated against the likelihood, basically the effect of uh, given a true value, uh, a true input, what's the distribution of outputs that the, the, simulate, the detector would, would generate. So from our observation distribution, observed distribution, we want to find the source distribution. But you know, especially when we can only run the simulator in the forward direction, we can't really compute these integrals. We don't, we can't estimate these densities. Um, so doing something like solving this problem with continuous functions or fitting a you know, over many variables is, is challenging. Um, in fact, one of the ways this is frequently done is kind of a histogram-based approach. We take our output distribution, we bin it. You know, we make a histogram of the outputs. Um, we can run the simulator with a bunch of different potential uh, input values. Um, look at the different output values that are that are um, that are observed, and we can bin that into a two D histogram. And this basically turns this into a linear inverse problem. The source distribution, the source histogram times the um, this two D likelihood matrix gives us the observation, and we can try to do inversion. And there's various techniques needed to make that stable. Um, one of the things I would note is this, this is, this kind of has a lot of problems with scaling. Um, it doesn't scale to high dimensions or many bins. Trying to populate a, a, a multidimensional histogram um, with sufficient statistics in the, in the bins is, is, can take enormous amounts of data. It can grow, it can grow exponentially. So this, this doesn't really scale to try to do multidimensional unfolding with, with high resolution or anything like that. So what we're instead trying to want to focus on is how can we do this continuously? How can we use generative models in this process? So um, we can focus on the goal here. So we have this uh, observed distribution that's related through to the source distribution through this integral, potentially over a high, large number of dimensions. And our, and our goal is to find the P of X, the source distribution that maximizes the likelihood of the observations. Now, this is an ill-posed problem. There's actually many source distributions that could do this, but our goal at this point is to find one of them. So um, the approach we're going to take is we're going to be using generative models to approximate both this likelihood, P of Y given X, the probability observed given true. And we're going to use a generative model to approximate the source distribution. I'll show you how we do that in the, in the upcoming slides. Um, and then in order to evaluate the likelihood of the observations, we're going to use Monte Carlo approximation. So this integral is a, it can be approximated with a sum where we basically sample data points from the source distribution that we're trying to learn, but we're going to sample it along the way. We sample it, we evaluate the likelihood at various, at, uh, for a given observation, we're going to evaluate the likelihood at, at uh, different source points, sum them up, and that gives us some estimate of the likelihood of the observation, assuming some source distribution. Now, nicely, this is, this is a, a nice, um, and continuous objective. We know how to relate P of Y now to, um, to P of X, and we'll see how to basically use that to optimize the parameters of P of X, but we'll be able to basically use gradient descent through this objective function here, which is a sum over uh, evaluations of a likelihood. So that's the general approach we're gonna use. Um, and we can kind of cart show a cartoon of how that works. So we'll start with uh, some observed variables here, Y. This is uh, some observation in a detector. Um, for instance. Um, so then what we do is we start by um, taking a generative model and using a generative model that can draw samples. So it doesn't matter at this point if it can draw plausible samples and they need to be the right dimensionality. But at this point, we have some generative model where we input random variables and it'll output values, um, potential uh, truth values, values that you might draw from the source distribution. So that's gonna be a neural network and it has some parameters theta and we don't know what they are yet. We initialize them and we can run that in the forward direction to generate a set of possible source uh, samples. These are possible true values. So we draw a bunch of samples. They may not be very likely, but that's okay. Um, 
And in fact, that's the important question. How do we evaluate how likely they are? So much like we saw in the previous example, um, with a simulator, we don't actually need to know what the distribution of source values is to learn the likelihood. We basically can just simulate over a bunch of different true, uh, true values, um, look at the observed values, and learn a generative model that helps that maps us from true values to observed values. That's basically like a, a generative model that's also conditioned on this value of x. So we can do that with lots of different kinds of generative models if we just want to sample data points. But one of the keys here is we don't just want to be able to sample data points, but we want to be able to evaluate this value of p of y given x. Um, nonetheless, we're going to use the same approach with a different kind of generative model. Um, so we're basically use uh, Giant or some simulator to simulate a bunch of true and observed pairs. Then we train a neural network based generative model to approximate that process. Once that's done, we can then um, evaluate it for any given observation. We know what Y is. We know what um, the source values are because we've sampled them from our test or our initial source distribution. So we can evaluate this likelihood and we kind of get these points along this, uh, this two-dimensional curve. So this is X and Y and the color corresponds in this case to P of Y given X, the likelihood. So we can um, evaluate all these values, sum them up, and that gives us an approximation of the marginal likelihood. And nicely, because this is just a sum over these likelihood evaluations, we can take the gradient of this whole sum and pass it all the way back to the parameters of the generative model. Now, the reason we can do that is, is exactly the same reason we can do that. We did that in the previous example. We, this likelihood is a neural network. We can take the gradient of the neural network with respect to, expect to its input x. And this x is going to be a sample from a generative model, which is continuously dependent on the parameters of that generative model. It's a, trans, it's a deterministic transformation of some noise. So we can take the gradients of these samples with respect to the parameters of the model and, and perform gradient descent. So we can now do backpropagation through our likelihood and through our samples in order to update the parameters of our source distribution. Um, now, we don't necessarily have just one observation, we may have many. So we'll take a bunch of observations. And what we'll do is we'll sum basically the likelihoods over all those observations so that we can learn a source distribution which is consistent with all of the observations we see. Now to make this numerically stable, we have to basically we compute the log likelihood. Um, and so we end up with this objective we see here on the, uh, in the middle. So we basically summing over different observations. Why? We're computing the log likelihood of this marginal, which is this internally this sum. Now this is a bit of a gross ob objective, but it is fully differentiable. Um, and although the, the, the gradients are biased, they, they're not so biased. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about that today, but we can get a pretty good approximation of both this objective function and its gradients in such a way that we can run gradient descent through this whole process through this loss function. Um, so great, we basically compute gradients, repeat sample data points, evaluate the likelihood, sum them up, take a gradient step and repeat. So this is kind of putting it all together. We have our, we're basically computed, that we wanna maximize the log likelihood of, um, of the observed data. We compute that through this, uh, this integral over this un unseen source distribution of X, and we approximate that with Monte Carlo integration, um, and then you perform gradient descent um, to, do the, to maximize the likelihood over the parameters. So our key now is we need to understand how we're gonna evaluate the likelihood and how we're gonna sample data points from the source distribution. And so here, again, we come back to using generative models to approximate these pieces of the, of the loss function. So specifically, we're gonna be using what's called a normalizing flow. So normalizing flow is, um, is, is, a, is a form of invertible neural network, but maybe uh, the best way to think about this is uh, through this well-known change of variables formula. So if I have some function that takes some variable, random variable z, and outputs some random variable x through a transformation phi, that the, the relationship between the probability distribution of x and the probability distribution of z is related through the change of variables. Formula p of x equals p of z times the determinant of the Jacobian of this transformation. So this is basically saying, however phi squeezes and stretches the volume, we need to take that into account in order to compute the probability of x if we knew the probability of z. Okay, so one of the keys here is we need to be able to um, sorry, so we're going to be looking for a transformation from z to x, basically from some simple noise distribution that we can easily sample from. And we're going to be trying to learn an approximation, uh, a transformation that will give us a sample of 
the data that came from the distribution we're looking for, which may be much more complicated. Now, there are a few key things about this transformation we're gonna to need to ensure. First, it'll need to be invertible. That's so that there's only, it's a one-to-one -one map and we don't have to sum over different um, potential points in either the Z or X space. Um, we're also gonna need it to be invertible so we can evaluate the likelihood as we'll see. Um, and we need its Jacobian to be tractable. In other words, if we just had to compute the determinant of any um, dense matrix, that could end up being a very costly computational operation. But there are ways to, there are uh, Jacobians, there are matrices whose determinants are easy to compute. And so we'll focus on transformations with, with easy to compute determinants. Um, now we don't do this all in one step. It's actually usually many layers of transformations kind of coupled together. Each one is invertible with a tractable, tra tractable Jacobian that we can then kind of, the determinant of a bunch of um, invertible matrices is gonna be the product of determinants. So we can basically chain them together and still compute everything. Um, so that's quite nice. And now each of these Gs, each of these, in, these small transformations is gonna be um, parameterized by a neural network. I'll show an example of what one of these looks like uh, in the coming slides. So nicely now, if we have some data point X and we want to evaluate its likelihood, we can basically, given a data point X, we can invert the transformation. So we're getting a um, where that point lies in Z space. We can then evaluate the likelihood we've seen here on the top right corner. So given this value of Z, we can compute P of Z. If it's a Gaussian, we know how to compute P of Z. Um, and we'll be able to compute this, determ this Jacobian determinant as we'll see on the next slide. So now we can evaluate the likelihood of a data point under the, this current transformation, and we can run gradient descent to optimize the, the normalizing flows parameters to better match the distribution of the data. And when we're done with this process, we basically have a neural network that we can input a sample of noise and output a plausible sample of, of our observe of our distribution we care about. And we can also invert that process. We can start with a, a, a data point and find out where it lives in, in noise space. And importantly, given an observation, we can also evaluate the likelihood of that observation. So that's why we're gonna use these models for, for our, our likelihood model in the empirical base setup. Um, so just a quick uh, example of a normalizing flow. One of these is called real MVP. This is one of the early models, one of the simpler ones, but still quite powerful. Um, so you can imagine our data is two dimensions, X1 and X2. And so we're looking for a transformation from noise Z um, to samples that might look like X. So here, um, basically the transformation is done component wise. For the first component of noise, we just map Z to X. So we do nothing to it. And the second component, we, we, uh, we, we take Z2, the second component, and multiply by some, the output of some neural network that only depends on Z1, and we add the output of some neural network that only depends on Z1. So nicely, this is basically algebraically invertible. You can basically subtract and divide, and that, that gives you the transformation from X to Z. And also very importantly, because the first trans part of this transformation does not depend on Z2, we end up with a Jacobian that's lower triangular and lower triangular Jacobians have determinants that are just the product of the diagonals. So that's a very fast operation then to compute. So in this case, the, the product of the diagonals is just in this F of Z2. Um, so this is how you kind of manipulate or design these transformations so that you always get a determinant which is easy to compute. And we may chain many of these these together. We're flipping which of the variables we keep static. So in the next layer of transformation, it would be Z1 gets the, this linear transformation and Z2 say six, fixed, mapping them back and forth to try to uh, build up a very complex transformation. So here's, here's an example of basically two Gaussian noise variables that are mapped through um, uh, some transformation that's learned, that learns how to sample from this kind of double ring. And not only can it learn how to sample from this double ring, but we can evaluate the likelihood at any point X1 and X2. So that's nice to see. And these are exactly the properties we're gonna need. Um, so when we look back at our objective function, which is this um, sum over likelihood values, we're gonna train a normalizing flow to approximate our simulator. We can do that up front. Given a value of, of input X, gen it can generate values of Y, of observations, and we can evaluate how likely that is or some approximation of the likelihood. And since we're gonna evaluate that on samples from our source distribution, we can use the fact that in a normalizing flow, we can easily sample data points. So we parameterize our source distribution with a normalizing flow and we basically use it as a sampler to generate points that we use in this summation, um, in this, this approximation of the likelihood. 
So that's all the pieces together. We can run gradient descent all the way back through um, this likelihood back to these values of X and back to the values of the parameters of this transformation. And once we optimize these the parameters of this transformation, we basically know now what the source distribution is. Okay, so does it work? There's many steps to this approximation, chaining together two generative models and using the gradients. So we can look at some toy problems. So here's a, here's a fun one. Um, this is basically a robot arm inverse kinematics problem. So if we start with some observation of where a robot arm ends up, what we wanna basically be able to do is understand the distribution of joint positions here. This is the, where the joints of this robot arm starts. X1 is the height and the angles, basically the, the robot arm angles here, X2, X3, and X4. So from some observation, we wanna estimate the distribution of joint positions and angles that could lead to the, the robot arm ending at that position. So you can see here, we for, for one data point, we've learned the distribution, we can, we can go and learn the distribution of all the different positions and, and joint angles that end at, this, uh, end at this particular position. And if we sample a bunch of observations, we can learn a source distribution that's consistent with all of them. So in this case, this is an example where we have the, the, the four um, uh, variables in the, in the robot arm. In blue are the true distributions, and in black are what we, what we learn when we run gradient descent through this, this likelihood approximation. So not only we can get reasonably good marginals here on the x-axis, these are just the, 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 the 1D distribution of each variable, we can also learn 2D correlations. Now it's not perfect here. This was actually a, an adapted deterministic problem that we added noise to. So there's um, it's actually quite sharp in terms of the, the likelihoods here. So we weren't able to approximate the very sharp peaks of the distribution, but we did a pretty reasonable job, especially looking at the 2D correlations. So we can also apply this in a physics setting. Eventually we wanna be applying this in, to physics measurements. So in this case, we were looking at um, ev events that have a Z boson recoiling off of a jet. So a jet is a stream of particles that's produced by a high energy quark or gluon. It's basically this stream you can see here, you can see the charged particles in a jet in, in solid lines, and then they smash into a detector and leave energy in a calorimeter. You can see different jets in different colors on, on the left here. So there's various properties we may want to measure or um, look at the distribution of and compare with theoretical predictions. One, for instance, being the jet mass. So using some simplified simulations, this isn't a full simulation of, 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 of Atlas or CMS, this is a simplified simulation. We can look at, for instance, generating um, uh, observations here of the jet mass distribution in black and comparing and uh, as compared to the true distribution that, that was uh, eventually smeared out by the detector here in blue. So our goal is to look from the black distribution, uh, estimate the blue distribution. And uh, we can do that. So this we unfolding in this case or estimating the source distribution in four variables here, the jet mass with um, some, of, some, um, the, some substructure variables, some um, features that are computed from all the particles within the jet. So we, here's basically a four dimensional unfolding and we'll look in the next slide a little more detail at the comparisons in the 1D marginal distributions. But we can see here also comparisons between the 2D correlations. So we're able to unfold continuously in, in four dimensions. So here black is the observed, uh, the learned distribution, and blue is the true source distribution. So when we compare also with, with some of the other models on the market these days, um, so here in, in black is the you know, quote unquote observed data, in green is the um, true values, and in blue is what we've been able to learn with this empirical Bayes based method, this unfolding method. And in red and gray, are some other um, methods. One is an iterative histogram based on folding method and another is an iterative reweighting method that's in red. So comparatively, we're able to do quite a good job, especially estimating the mass, um, the mass distribution and all the distribution simultaneously. I should mention that this reweighting approach is also, also multidimensional. Um, but um, unlike the histogram based approach, which basically can do one, one distribution at a time. So there's some chaos tests at the bottom, which show that um, especially the two multidimensional approaches are, are both reasonably uh, good at doing this unfolding uh, in comparison to the true distribution. Um, and they're, they're comparative. Um, one of the things that's quite interesting going beyond unfolding source distributions is the fact that we can actually compute posteriors. So once we've learned a likelihood distribution and we've learned a source distribution, we can actually then draw samples from the posterior given some new observation. This is because the posterior is proportional to the likelihood times the source distribution. So this we might wanna do, for instance, given um, some observed electron energy, we may wanna know the distribution of true electron energies 
that could plausibly have generated that observation. So P of true given ob observed. So that's essentially reconstruction where we get an entire distribution out, some understanding or some estimate of the uncertainty of that reconstruction. So the way we can do this is we given some observation, we can sample a bunch of points from the source distribution and do rejection sampling um, where we reject them basically with probability uh, that's proportional to the likelihood. Now that might sound really inefficient, but remember these are all normalizing flows. We can sample a million data points in six, you know, less than six seconds or something, like three, five seconds. I, I don't remember the exact numbers and it depends on the model, but it's extremely fast to sample data points. So even if the rejection sampling is highly inefficient, it doesn't take long in order to, to sample enough data points to populate a posterior distribution. So here we can see our four dimensional example. We given we had some observation where we knew the true value here, the stars in red or the lines in red. And we can see the, the estimated posterior distribution, basically the reconstructed distribution in blue and black. Black is just outlining the blue distribution here. So that's quite nice. We can do reconstruction with uncertainty estimates. Um, and just to test if this is actually working, we can estimate, we can do what's called posterior calibration. We can look at, if you look at where these, uh, the true values lie in the estimated posterior distribution, what quantile they, they fall in, the fraction of events that fall in a given quantile should be proportional to that quantile. So it's basically the fraction of events in a quantile um, should be a straight line. And we see that for each of our four variables that we, uh, that we learned a source distribution over in computed posteriors, um, we can see these calibration curves. They're reasonably close to a straight line with slope equals one. They're not perfect, but they're reasonably good, giving us some idea that, that we would be able to get reasonable uncertainty estimates out of these, um, out of this uh, reconstruction approach that might work this way. So we can do reasonable posterior calibration, posterior estimation as well. So I think that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, we've kind of talked about um, various ways in which we can use generative models and especially rely on not only their approximation capabilities, but their gradient capabilities. Um, now, it's not always easy to set up um, loss functions and it's not always easy to optimize them. So there's certainly work to be done there, but I think it's, it's showing some promising directions and how we can put together generative models and simulators to try to um, approach data analysis challenges we have in high energy physics and in other sciences as well, um, and extend them beyond, for instance, problems where we can only operate in one dimension to, to kind of multi-dimensional inference challenges. So uh, thank you very much. Oh, nice. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a great talk. And I think we've got some more minutes for questions. So if people have any more questions, then please raise your hands. Okay, Louis, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay. Hey, yeah, very nice talk. A lot of material covered there. Um, <laughs> I just wondered with your uh, unfolding example, um, sort of traditional unfolding methods uh, have to introduce regularization in order to get a nice looking answer. You've got the regularization built in automatically, have you? And Yeah, so there's a few points to that. So the first, there's a few levels of regularization here, depending on what you want to do. So the first level of regu regularization actually comes from the entire idea of a normalizing flow. Um, we have to basically, we're only able to learn bijective continuous transformations. These all have um, gradients that are compute. So these are continuous functions with computable gradients. Um, so that's already a regularization in the kinds of functions that we could get out of this um, learning process. So we've thrown out everything that has any sort of a discontinuity. So that's already a, quite a big regularization that might be akin to a smoothness regularization you would put in a histogram based unfolding approach. So we've got smoothness built in. Um, and then if we want to add more regularization, for instance, if we wanted to, we could, we could make, um, uh, well, there's not a good example well, here, we can also add regularization in, form of, in the form of the structure of the model. We could ensure, for instance, that the, the model always output values, for instance, between zero and one, if we think the output should always be constrained between zero and one, or we could ensure that it's symmetric about zero. Um, so we're basically always, um, that the probability for a point that's at minus X and plus X is, is the same. So we can add this kind of structural regularization as well to help make the learning process uh, work better. Oh, incidentally, on this slide, I mean, you were saying that the correlations are, are sort of nicely reproduced, but actually it looks as if all the correlations are about zero. So uh, 
Yeah, I should say the shapes of this level, the level sets. <laughs> Maybe the okay. correlation was all right. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, the shapes. I grant you that a bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just one other question. Um, in the unfolding example, you said your gradients were biased, whereas right. in the first half of the talk, your gradients were unbiased. That's right. What's the difference? Right. So the difference here is when you take um, it's this logarithm. So when you take uh, an when you have an integral and you use a Monte Carlo approximation of that integral, it's typically unbiased. And so when you're taking the gradient of that approximation, you're, you might have a noisy approximation, but on average it's unbiased. However, the log of, the, of a sum is not an unbiased estimate of the log of the integral. Okay. So there's a small bias there and that bias drops as one over n. So the more samples we, um, the more samples we draw, the more, um, the faster, the, the, the smaller the bias will be and that bias will drop with one over the number of samples. Now, the reason why I said it didn't really matter is because once we're talking about these generative models which can draw samples very easily, we can basically, the, mem the, the constraint on reducing the bias here was the memory of the computer and not the speed. It was very fast to draw samples, but we might have to generate, um, to do this summation here, we might have to generate um, thousands of, of, of points to do this, uh, to compute this sum. Uh, my last comment on this is you can actually debias. These are called like nested Monte Carlo approximations, this kind of sum of a log of a sum, even the log of a sum. You, it turns out you can debias these by introducing varia, variance. Basically, you introduce a random number about where you stop this sum. And uh, you can, in the end, get a debiased estimate, an estimate which is zero bias, but noisier. Uh, and we found that it was better to just draw more samples than to, to introduce these debiasing techniques. It was kind of more work than was necessary. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Duncan. Hi, um, can I ask my first question again with respect to this setup? <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I also have a, a follow-up if that's okay. So I, yeah, I'm just curious as to, again, the, the kind of training data that's required. Yeah. Uh, right, so uh, in the toy samples, I think we would, uh, I think the toy samples, these toy experiments, there was a few of them that we looked at. I only showed one here. Uh, I think we used um, something like 10,000 uh, simulated data points to train the, the, the um, to train the likelihood and then something like 10,000 observations to do, to do the source distribution estimation. So that's this example. Um, these, these toy examples, which were relatively not so complicated. They're mostly just trying to make sure we could understand what we're doing. Yeah. Um, in the physics setup, I think we had one point, something like 1.5 million events that we split between, well, basically what we, what we, would, what we did was, uh, there's a subtlety here, we would train the likelihood actually using a Pythia, a sample of I think about a million Pythia events. And then we actually unfolded from a Herwig set of ob observations, which was, uh, I think on the order of another 800,000 or million events. So I, um, I, I use similar approaches, but with, um, well, okay, so I've been using a ABC, so the approximate Bayesian computation to, to solve inverse problems yeah. with climate models. And there we use a Gaussian process surrogate to, to get around the fact that we just, you know, we can't generate anywhere near that number of yeah. climate model simulations. Um, could, is there a way of, combining this with a surrogate i mean would you i guess it's just introducing another another set of uncertainties right what, what's the benefit of of the normalizing flow over over something like um gp enhanced abc well i well I, maybe we'll like sub, um, separate the abc part from the gp part from okay. that question um yep. so for the gp part um Right, so in principle, you can, uh, if you can reasonably sample data points, uh, observations from your um, GP, then you can use that as an estimate for your source distribution. Basically, you need some sort of relatively fast sampler. Yeah. Um, and anything you can use that, you, that, that can evaluate, that can approximate the likelihood, that can give you a likelihood evaluation, you can use inside of, um, for the likelihood problem. So GPs are compatible. Um, it's a question of how fast you can get them to, to train. So if you have fewer data and your GP model is easier to train um, to estimate the likelihood, then that's totally compatible. 
Um, and they're also differentiable. So that would completely work. Um, now for comparing with ABC is a good question. I think, um, you know, one of the things we wanted to do here is not, well, it depends on, right. I mean, in, in this sense, we, we weren't trying to do an exhaustive search over the kind of observed variables that we might need to, to define in order to do the, um, the source distribution estimation. Um, so, I mean, in ABC, you, you have some um, summary statistics depending on how you're, how you're doing it, um, uh, which I, sorry, I, I, that may depend, but it, we, we've yeah. basically not focused so much on defining summary statistics in order to be able to, to define a loss function um, in a lower dimensional space. So we can in principle unfold up to larger and larger dimensions, but of course that requires more and more data to approximate this likelihood. Um, yeah. We did a little bit of, tuning of like, we played a little bit with the observ the variables we tried to unfold in this um, physics example, but but we didn't have to spend a lot of time doing that. So I guess that's probably the benefit here. We're, we're not, we don't need to do a search over um, summary statistics. And you don't, yes, you don't have that curse of dimensionality that you do with, with ABC. You don't have to define epsilon, right? We don't have to define epsilon, um, but we do have to train an, a, a generative model. Yeah. And that can be a little bit data hungry. So that's probably one of the trade-offs there. Interesting, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, I've also got a small question on the first part, if I may. So Please. on slide 27 or, or thereabouts, when you spoke about, um, uh, when you spoke about training your local generative model for the estimate of the local gradient there. Um, so from, from what I understand, you sort of sample new, you get new samples as you go along. Um, uh, the optimization. Is there, but your new region, let's say, might overlap partially with ones that you have already visited before. Did, did you have to play any tricks on, you know, how to pick wisely new data points such they're maximally informative or whatever of your local grade or of the gradient estimated by your local generative model? That would be, uh, that's a very good question. We did not try to play any tricks of trying to maximize some, some sort of information gain about the, the, the gradient. That would actually be quite interesting. Um, no, we, we would basically resample new points. And if there were overlaps, we, we basically stored a replay buffer like you might in reinforcement learning. We stored a bunch of um, uh, simulations from previous values of the parameters and we, we might use them in, in later gradient descent steps. Now, we actually found that um, once you do that, you you we sometimes it would introduce a bias in the gradient estimation that we didn't totally understand. So um, often we wouldn't use this replay buffer, and basically leaving the understanding of um, where that bias is coming from for for future work because we didn't totally understand it. I see. Curious. I think it was shaping right. If you sample everything on one side of the of this kind of hype of this like local region, maybe biasing the kind of. Uh, how much emphasis the generative model um, places on learning one side of the loss function versus another, and that may affect the approximation yeah. quality. Yeah, that would be an argument in favor of doing something smarter than just having a replay buffer and sampling new points, right? Yeah, like absolutely. Sampling them in a way that makes makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a good question, but we didn't we we didn't we didn't get to that point. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Duncan, you still have your hand up. Is that from before, or do you have a new one? Sorry, no, as from before. Okay, nice. Okay, if there's nothing else, then I think we can wrap up for today. Thanks a lot for joining everybody. Thanks a lot for people asking questions. And most of all, thanks to Michael for this wonderful talk. That's it. Speak to you next week. <laughs>